Welcome to Module 2, Building Better Soils. This section of Module 2 will be focused on secondary nutrients and micronutrients. And I'm Heather Darby from the University of Vermont Extension. As you know, there are many essential minerals that are required by plants. And these are grouped into three basic categories. Primary macronutrients, and we hear a lot about those, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And then we have our secondary macronutrients that include sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. And then finally, we have the micronutrients, boron, chlorine, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, nickel, and zinc. Generally, there's a few others included as well, such as silica. Now again, these are categorized into these three major groups, not based on the fact that one nutrient is more important than the other, but they're actually grouped based on relative quantity of the nutrient that's needed by the plant. So a macronutrient is required by the plant and it's needed in larger quantities, and a micronutrient is also required for growth and function of the plant, but is required in very small quantities. So again, they're all essential to plant productivity and health, and they're all required, but they're just required in different amounts. This slide shows the micronutrients and its plant available form. Now, all of the crops um, require varying levels of micronutrients. As we know, there are some crops that we work with on our organic dairy farms that require high levels of certain micronutrients. As an example, pastures, especially pastures that have legumes, require lots of boron. Boron is a nutrient that has high requirements by legumes and also molybdenum. And molybdenum is actually a micronutrient that's utilized with the nitrogen fixing bacteria associated with the legume. If you compare that to grasses, like a small grain silage or a small grain, you can see that grasses overall have relatively low requirements for boron. It's important to understand if a crop actually has a higher need for a micronutrient because in those particular cases, it may actually be necessary to add micronutrients to maintain the overall productivity of that crop. It's important to understand, again, that just because these nutrients are needed in small quantities doesn't mean that they're not important. And you can see all the very essential metabolic plant processes that micronutrients play a role in or are required for. Processes that include photosynthesis, carbohydrate synthesis in the plant, protein th synthesis, fatty acid synthesis, different enzyme activations, cell wall formation, and then just overall tolerance to stress. So you can see if any of these micronutrients are in deficiency, then the plant will have a difficult time maintaining productivity, health, and, and quality as well. You can see some micronutrients in particular play a very important role in almost every metabolic process that happens in the plant, and copper is, is an important example of that. It can be an enzyme activator. It's also involved in photosynthesis. And this is also true for micronutrients such as manganese. It's really important to understand that micronutrients have a very fine line between deficiency and toxicity. There really is a balance. Because they're required in such small amounts, it's very easy to over-apply a micronutrient. Here's an example of a micronutrient, the nutrient concentration in the plant tissue and plant yield. And you can see right here that this sort of line between sufficiency, toxicity, and deficiency is very narrow. It's very different than a macronutrient that's the sufficiency level can be much broader. So it's important to recognize that just because a crop needs copper or needs boron, adding large quantities of that micronutrient could actually change a sufficient system into a very toxic system very, very quickly. So again, remember that micronutrients are essential, but we have to be careful in how much we add to the soils or if we even need to add them to the soil 
because it is very, very fine line between going from a deficient or a sufficient stage to toxicity in a plant. There's a lot of interest in adding micronutrients on farms, dairy farms, vegetable farms, and of course, there's good reason to want to add micronutrients. I just showed you how important they are in maintaining the overall health and productivity of your plant. But it's difficult to actually understand how much micronutrients we need to add to the soil. There's not a lot of research done um, in various parts of the United States. There are certain micronutrients and secondary macronutrients that are commonly deficient in crops. We see deficiencies because of soil type or because of the crop itself or a combination of the two. And so we know that we should be adding those nutrients because we know that our soils are depleted in those or that we're growing crops that need high levels of those. In general, we can use soil tests to diagnose some micronutrients and the, and the common three that are diagnosed with soil tests are boron, manganese, and zinc. And then many micronutrients are diagnosed through plant tissue analysis, including copper, iron, molybdenum, chlorine, and nickel. So when do you actually go out and apply micronutrients? Some folks apply very, very small quantities on a yearly basis. Some folks apply very small quantities of micronutrient packages, you know, by year or every three or four years. It is a bit dangerous to continually apply something when we don't know if it's needed and also because many of these micronutrients can actually build up in the soil. So it is important to understand what the crop requirement is and then use the other tools that we have such as soil tests, crop observation, soil tests, and plant tissue tests if needed as well. There are lots of soil conditions that seem to be leading to micronutrient deficiencies in plants. So a micronutrient like boron that has a negative charge and doesn't stick to the soil organic matter or to the clay particles in the soil, it's very prone to leaching out of the soil. So if you have a very sandy soils or very low organic matter soils, you can and often could see boron deficiencies. And you can see other conditions. Here's an example of manganese, where we will often see manganese deficiencies when pHs are high, with very high clay contents and high organic matter contents. It can get bound up in the soil. And then we can also see deficiencies when the soils are very cold and wet. So again, understanding the soil conditions and what soil conditions can lead to micronutrient deficiencies in crops is important. So just in general, when we're talking about micronutrients, there are some rules of thumb. First of all, we do know that maintaining a soil pH between 6 and 6.8 on medium texture soils will generally supply adequate amount of micronutrients to crops. Having well-drained soil, again, lessens the toxic effect of some micronutrients like iron and manganese. And of course, we generally see far less micronutrient deficiencies where plant residues and animal manure or compost are regularly applied to the soil. I think as we know, animal manure or composted animal manures contain nutrients from the feeds that animals have ate. So if you're feeding a mineral supplement to your animals, often much of that makes it into the manure and then out into your fields. So again, maintaining pH is important to making sure that we don't see significant micronutrient deficiencies or toxicities. And you can see having this pH between 6 and 6.8 really optimizes nutrient availability, macro and micro. So let's talk a little bit about deficiencies. Um, show some symptoms that you'll see if you're experiencing a, a deficiency and, and talk about uh, where we might see those. So magnesium, we have observed magnesium deficiencies throughout the Northeast especially. Um, it is an exchangeable cation, which means it exchanges itself on and off the negative charges on your soil, and it will compete with potassium for those exchange sites. We have seen magnesium deficiencies in corn and other crops, and we're most likely to see those when the soil potassium is very, very high. 
because again the potassium will outcompete the magnesium for binding sites on the soil. Here's a graph that illustrates again that principle when we see high levels of potassium we see low levels of magnesium in the feed. Okay, so they're actually competing for each other for binding sites on the soil but also for uptake into the crop. So if your potassium levels are very, very high, then it will outcompete magnesium and you'll end up with high potassium levels in your feed and low magnesium levels. Now again, this is something that we do experience on pastures, especially in the spring, something that's called grass tetany. And grass tetany is a condition that cows can experience, especially early in the spring when they have low blood magnesium levels. This is ultimately associated with early spring grazing where there's a low magnesium levels in the soil and high potassium levels. It often results in low magnesium feed resulting in grass tetany in the animals. Sulfur deficiencies can also be common and have been seen across the United States as well. They're very similar to nitrogen deficiencies. They look very similar except the symptoms really start on the younger leaves, not the older leaves. And again, we can see sulfur deficiencies on sandy soils, soils of low organic matter, and especially in areas of high rainfall on fields that have little or no manure. Again, sulfur has a negative charge, so it does not stick to the soil at all and is easily leachable. So under these conditions, we have experienced sulfur deficiencies. There are different ways for you to be able to add sulfur to your fields. And one primary way is to add manure to the soil. There's approximately two pounds of sulfur in every ton of manure. Air emissions also, just lightning, rainfall, we estimate about eight pounds per acre per year. And then finally, there's sulfur in many commercial fertilizers. Some of those approved for organic, such as Sopomag, where you can also receive high quantities of sulfur if needed. So how do you know if you need to add sulfur? Well, if you're on a lighter textured soil, again with low organic matter, and you've seen some visual symptoms, then you may consider adding sulfur to the soil. And again, there's organic approved sources of sulfur. And you can also do a plant tissue analysis for sulfur and look for the nitrogen to sulfur ratio. And if you do a tissue analysis for sulfur, here's a couple of examples of crops and their sulfur requirements. And you can see here, just as an example, for corn, if you took a sample at ear leaf or green silk, then you're looking for a range between 0.18 and 0.4% sulfur. When you're using tissue analysis to determine deficiencies, it's important to use local information and local data that can be gained through your university extension system. Zinc deficiency has been an occasional problem in corn, especially in the Northeast, and these symptoms begin on the youngest leaves. Again, we um, can see zinc deficiencies when acid soils have been limed to a pH of 7, so basically going from a relatively acidic soil right to a pH of 7 can cause a zinc tie-up. When soil test is high for P, zinc can also be tied up by the phosphorus sometimes in the cool spring or on soils that have had little or no manure. Boron deficiency, again, is common in many parts of the country, especially in the Northeast. It's a problem, um, especially in alfalfa and trefoil, and we can also see it in many of our clovers. It's, again, most likely to occur on soils that are easily leached because it does have a negative charge and doesn't stick to the soil. Sometimes we see boron deficiencies during dry periods and especially in soils that have pHs above 7 because it becomes highly adsorbed to other minerals. With boron deficiency symptoms, we see that yellowing chlorosis with the reddening on the top, especially the newest leaves, and sometimes you can have a shortened sort of bushy look to the plant. Essentially, the inner node growth has been shortened usually don't see deficiencies too much in first cut, something that you see after first cut, especially during dry weather. And one word of caution is to make sure that 
when you identify boron deficiency that you're not actually looking at potato leafhopper injury, which is commonly confused with boron deficiency. So here again, you can see the reddening on the exterior of the leaves, especially on the new growth. And here's a photo of potato leafhopper injury in alfalfa, which is more of a yellowing V-shaped necrosis on the tips of the leaves. Manganese deficiency has been identified on grasses and legumes. It's been observed in the Midwest and in the Northeast. It's very distinct. You see this inner venal chlorosis, especially in the newest leaves and soybeans. And you can often see stunted growth and sometimes early leaf drop. We also see manganese deficiencies in small grains and sometimes it can actually be confused with some diseases. So again, manganese can be a very common deficiency. Um, some susceptible soil conditions are those with very high pH, very high organic matter. Some soils that are particularly wet um, and of heavy clay. And then as mentioned earlier, manganese can be diagnosed with a standard soil test with optimum levels being between 11 and 20 parts per million. Now, of course, there's lots of other micronutrients, and on occasion, we do see deficiencies of copper, chloride, iron, molybdenum, and nickel, but I would say that we see far less of those deficiencies than the others that have already been mentioned. Occasionally, we do see iron deficiency on soybeans, especially those that are grown on very high pH soils, and we can also see the same in corn as well. So deficiencies are often related or linked to the overall condition of our soil. So just to talk about two of the other micronutrients that people are commonly concerned about, copper being one, because it is so essential in so many plant functions. And when you have a copper deficiency, it does stunt the overall growth of the plants. It can reduce nodulation of legumes. It can delay flowering and maturity because, again, it's very, very critical to so many functions in the plant. We don't see copper deficiencies very often, but when we do, it's generally on very sandy soils with very high pHs and, again, very low organic matter with no manure application or other organic matter application either. There are some interactions that occur with other nutrients, so we have to be cautious of that too. Often we have fields on dairy farms that are excessive in phosphorus, and that excessive phosphorus can also reduce the overall plant uptake of copper. Molybdenum, we have seen molybdenum deficiencies. Again, it's relatively rare, but because it's such an important nutrient, especially as it relates to legumes, we do need to recognize that it can become deficient. It does have a significant effect on pollen formation and grain formation, as well as protein synthesis. So again, it's important to understand soil type, soil conditions that can impact the availability of this micronutrient. As I've mentioned a few times over the course of this presentation, manure can be a very good source of micronutrients. And looking at a standard manure test, here's an analysis from a manure sample in Vermont. You can see the level of micronutrients that can be found in the manure. So if we're looking at boron in particular, 0.03 of a pound per ton. It's not a substantial amount, but if you're putting on 10 tons of manure, then you're putting on roughly a third of a pound of boron each application. So it is important to understand when you're adding manure on a yearly basis, you also are adding micronutrients. So again, you don't want to overdo it. So it's good to understand what soil conditions lead to micro deficiencies. You can use information from soil tests and putting that information together by looking at the condition of your plants can help you better understand when and if you should be adding additional micronutrient fertility to your farm. So in conclusion, it's important to recognize and think about when you should be actually applying micronutrients. First, understanding what the requirements of the crop are and if there are any specific micronutrients that this crop requires in high amounts. What are the soil conditions like? Look at the pH. High and low pHs can trigger deficiencies of micronutrients. Has manure been added to this soil in the past? And what's the level of micronutrients in the manure? 
looking at plant observations, and then finally soil tests. These are, are all pieces of information to use to determine if micronutrients should be added to a field or a crop.